Hello again, uh, Pastor Marcus Williams. I wanted to make a video on sacred scripture and its authority, um, principally from some considerations in Johann Gerhard's book on interpreting the sacred scripture and method of theological study. Uh, this especially regards scripture's authority considered in itself and then scripture's authority in relation to the church. Uh, this won't be a very long video, uh, as some of you know who follow these conversations on the social medias, um, Gavin Ortland recently did a debate with Trent Horn uh, on the topic of Sola Scriptura, uh, which was highly commendable effort and would commend that um, debate to anyone who has not seen it. I think it's over on uh, the Pints with Aquinas channel. Uh, afterward, uh, Dr. Ortland did a stream together with Joshua Shooping and another guy called Sean from Anglican Aesthetics, uh, and they just did kind of a debrief and breakdown of how the debate went. And then after that, Joshua Shooping made a longer video by himself reflecting on further considerations regarding uh, sacred scripture, which was also very excellent. And I'll put links to all those videos uh, in the description of this video. Of course, if you're watching this video... Uh, you probably have already seen the others, <laughs> given the fact that I'm small potatoes compared to uh, Truth Unites and so forth. In any case, I just wanted to add some further reflections on this topic uh, from Johann Gerhard and uh, give you more to think about regarding Sacred Scripture's authority. And I think I'll do a series of videos on Sacred Scripture, its authority, its perfection, its perspicuity, uh, as Gerhard discusses these things, and then talk about some principles of interpretation uh, from Martin Chemnitz and Johann Gerhard, especially as they reflect on uh, the Holy Fathers and their use of the Word of God and how they interpreted the sacred scriptures. And I think that this is very important because this might not be the formal position of the Orthodox Church, I don't know for sure. It is the formal position of the Roman Catholic Church that the sacred scripture is not perspicuous, that it lacks clarity, and therefore, the approach to the Word of God uh, is somewhat discouraged, if not explicitly, at least implicitly, to say, well, this book doesn't uh, possess a clarity in it, and you might break your neck if you read it. Now, obviously, we can all agree that there should be some principles of approach to the reading of the sacred scriptures, but they're not so high-flown and unattainable uh, as it is made to seem. You have to strive for years or whatever through ascetic struggle or you know, the cleansing of your noose or the uh, taking upon yourself this kind of mystical phronema of the church uh, in order to understand the word of God. I actually think that that is contrary uh, to the mind of the church, as I would aim to demonstrate on the video on perspicuity and principles of scriptural interpretation, a lot of which, uh, frankly, the Lutheran reformers draw from uh, the Holy Fathers, principally uh, St. Irenaeus and uh, St. Augustine, though references to other others of the Church Fathers. Uh, but that will be a forthcoming video. For today, uh, and very briefly now, I just want to go through some uh, matters related to uh, Sacred Scripture's authority. Now, in the first place, Johann Gerhard says that Sacred Scripture and its authority uh, can be inquired of in two ways. I'm only interested in this video in the first way, but in the, in the two ways are the following. First, he says that the scripture's authority can be inquired in absolutely. That is to say, considered according as its authority is internal in and through itself without respect to our knowledge. That is to say, what is the word of God in and of itself, uh, regardless of our appropriation uh, of the word of God? Uh, here he says, all the authority of scripture depends on God alone. For God, who speaks to us in and through the scriptures, is truth itself. Um, and so uh, the inscripturated word of God is uh, to be thought of, in other words, no differently than uh, the manner in which God spoke to the prophets. Uh, God's word came to the prophet Isaiah or whatever. Um, because he is truth itself, his word, as it is inscripturated, is uh, truth itself, and it depends uh, upon him and upon him alone. Uh, the second consideration or the second inquiry regarding the authority of Scripture, he says, is that it can be considered relatively. That is to say, with respect to our knowledge and understanding, that is how it becomes known to us. How do we appropriate 
appropriate it to ourselves as the authoritative word of God. And there he does uh, at various times talk about the testimony of the church and the internal testimony of the Holy Spirit and the internal consistency of the word of God and the fulfillment of prophecies and so forth like this. But we'll leave that to the side for now and just stick with this consideration of the absolute authority of the word of God. Now, uh, he will in this brief chapter come to the question of a scriptural authority in relation to the church. That is to say, how do we consider uh, the church and the question of the sacred scripture? Is the church subordinated to the word of God? Is there some kind of co-equality between them? Is the church above the scripture? And so forth like this. Um, he has a section in which he writes the following. It is claimed that the authority of scripture arises from the church. Okay. Now there's an assertion and a claim. So he does what's obvious, which is to say, well, how do you prove it? How do you come to this conclusion? And so he writes, quote, ask the papacy why the church's witness is a mark of undoubted and certain faith. And they will answer from the Council of Trent because it is guided by the Holy Spirit. And thus it cannot err in its decisions and decrees. Then he says, ask further uh, how they know it is guided by the Holy Spirit. And they will answer that Christ promised this as it is written in Matthew 28, 20. Behold, I am with you even to the consummation of the age. Or John 16, 13, the Holy Spirit will lead you into all truth. Now, leaving aside whether or not uh, those uh, passages in sacred scripture actually prove, let's say, what's claimed to be proved. That is, that it uh, bestows or demonstrates that the church has this uh, ability not to err or whatever uh, in and of itself in its own capacity, uh, even without consideration of the sacred scripture. Uh, leaving just even that claim aside, uh, Gerhard goes on and says, quote, but if then this authority of the church is to be proved to me from scripture, then scripture's authority must necessarily be sacrosanct and authoritative for me already beforehand. Otherwise, you'd be proving an uncertainty with something equally uncertain. Uh, in other words, if you're proving uh, this assertion on the basis of the word of God, <laughs> well, then it's, uh, let's say, self-evident that that by which you prove what you're asserting has more authority than the very thing that you're claiming is the case. Um, so the church doesn't possess this authority, according to Gerhard, in some co-equal way to the scripture or in some uh, certainly imbalanced way where the sacred scripture is subordinated under the church, but it's just the reverse, right? That the sacred scripture uh, is authoritative for the church, and it's from the sacred scripture that the church speaks and not independent of it. This is why uh, Martin Chemnitz, in his examination of the Council of Trent, denies this eighth kind of tradition, which is to say uh, decrees or statements from the church that have no clear basis in the word of God, and yet are commended to us as uh, to be held in equal authority and, e and with equal reverence as what we find in the sacred scripture. But then he goes on to uh, some kind of objection that might follow from what he has already said regarding the relation of sacred scripture to the church. Um, and the, the rejoinder is something like, but the dogma of the canon is an article of faith. The dogma of the canon is not found in sacred scripture. Therefore, an article of faith is not found in the sacred scripture, right? And you've heard this before, right? Well, sola scriptura is not in the scripture or the canon is not in the scripture. So you're basing your whole uh, theological approach on something that isn't even attested to in the word of God and isn't, uh, um, and isn't found with you or whatever. Okay, so what is Gerhard's uh, response to this claim that the dogma of the canon is an article of faith um, and yet the dogma of the canon is not found in scripture. And so where must it be found? Well, it must be found uh, with the church, right? Therefore, an article of faith is not found in the sacred scripture again. This is uh, Gerhard's response. Quote, the dogma of the canon, properly speaking, is not an article of faith, which is kind of an interesting response. And then he says, uh, seeing as Moses, the prophets, the evangelists, and the apostles, by their act of writing, did not manufacture a new article of faith that was newly superadded to those prior articles which they taught orally. And further he says, quote, The dogma of the canon is the principle of the articles of the faith, but not properly an article of the faith. Therefore the church by its witness to the canon does not make a new article of the faith, 
but leads people to know the principle upon whose knowing all following knowledge of the articles of faith depends. And then here is really, I think, the clincher, quote, The scriptures are not canonical because the church bears witness to them. Rather, they are made known as being canonical because the church bears witness to them. And I'll put some of these quotes in the video description so that you can consider them yourselves. Uh, I would like to add this, and I'm not sure whether or not this analogy works, but let's just say, for example, we grant, um, we grant that the church doesn't just recognize the canon and then commends it, right? But in some way instantiates it, in some way uh, makes these books authoritative. Our position would be that they possess authority upon their being breathed out and written, right? That the church doesn't bestow that kind of authority. Only God has the ability uh, and does bestow that kind of authority on that which has been written. And therefore, then the church recognizes it and commends this authoritative word uh, for those to consider it as being God-breathed as what it claims to be. But let's just say for the sake of argument, uh, we allow for this uh, position to stand. That the church in some way makes the canon authoritative rather than, uh, rather than um, witnessing to its authority. Uh, I was thinking of this analogy. If I'm playing a pickup game of backyard baseball, and let's say that the pickup game of backyard baseball even precedes me. I just walk into someone's backyard and I see these guys playing backyard baseball. And they say, all right, uh, Pastor Williams, here are the rules for the uh, pickup game. And uh, they lay them all out for me. And then in the course of time, one of them violates the rules that they themselves created, okay? And they say to me, well, you can't actually use the rule against me because I made the rule, right? And so you therefore got the rule for me and you can't use it against me. Uh, it seems to me that that is uh, totally absurd, right? And after all, the word canon means rule. <laughs> so even if it were the case, and I'm not granting this, uh, but just for the sake of the argument, if it were the case that the authority of the canon is actually bestowed upon it by the church, that wouldn't mean it cannot be used in such way as to reprove those who hold positions of authority in the church. Because as a rule, it stands as an external standard for all, presumably in the church, right? And so I, in either case, I, I don't think that uh, even if we were to grant the argument that this would do much against the argument uh, in favor of sola scriptura. The last thing I want to add here is an insight from Wilhelm Lea. Now, this book has kind of a confusing title. It's his book titled uh, Three Books About the Church. Uh, and Wilhelm Lea addresses this question about the church existing prior to the scripture, right? And you hear this argument very often. Well, the church exists prior to the word of God uh, or the scripture. And so therefore... It is authoritative in a maximal way, and the sacred scripture is somehow subordinated to the church, or it can only be understood by the church which existed prior to it. Now, here is Wilhelm Lea's response to this kind of argument. Quote, It is true that the first congregation in Jerusalem, that is the earliest church, was in existence before a single book of the New Testament could be read in its assemblies. And then what does he do? He throws up his hands and he says, well, I guess we have to grant the point and we must convert either to the Roman West or to the Orthodox East. No, his response in the first place is to say, so what? <laughs> He's not even convinced uh, about this argument. It doesn't seem to hold any sway with him. And then he goes on as follows. The first congregation came from the oral word of the apostles. The word which was heard on the first Pentecost and which is read today is the same word. Okay, so that there is this identity or identical nature between that which was preached by the apostles and that which is inscripturated in what we have uh, in the canon of the New Testament. The fact that the Spirit of the Lord caused the word to be written does not make it younger than the church, which had earlier come from the same Spirit. Just as little as the faith of the 3,000 gave apostolic authority to Peter's first sermon. So little does the faith of the first three centuries give authority to the written word of the apostles. As the faith of the first congregation, its testimony to the sermon it heard, and its very existence were a fruit of the oral word of Peter, which was a divine sermon, so the later congregations, their faith and their testimony to the word, are fruits of the same word, which they read 
and which was preached to them. And then he concludes uh, in this way, quote, Far from the early churches lacking the uniting force of the apostolic word, it was an obvious uniting force when the apostles lived and taught and wrote in the church. So it is just as silly as it is trivial to claim that the church is older than the scriptures of the New Testament, for it is certainly not older than the word of the New Testament scriptures or of the Old Testament either, but we shall not discuss that now. Now, that latter thing about the Old Testament always strikes me as the thing that is supremely overlooked, right? Well, the church didn't have the scriptures. And it's like, well, they had the Old Testament. What do you mean they didn't have the scriptures? I mean, it's the very Old Testament texts, uh, the prophets, Joel, for example, that St. Peter is proclaiming uh, from in his first sem sermon on Holy Pentecost. Of course they had the sacred scriptures. Now, if you want to say, well, they didn't have a completed canon or whatever, but I don't think that really... Uh, bears upon this question, or is a defeater for sola scriptura? I mean, I don't feel the force of that argumentation. And the point further that Wilhelm Leia is making here when he says uh, that to claim that the church is older than the scriptures of the New Testament does not even contend with the fact that the church is certainly not older than the word of the New Testament scriptures. And what he means there, of course, is uh, earlier he identifies the oral preaching of the apostles with what is later inscripturated. So the church certainly doesn't precede the word of the New Testament. Uh, however true it might be that certain churches precede the inscripturating of the very things that are proclaimed by the apostles. So the authority of the sacred scriptures um, is the very thing that governs the church and not the other way around. And I would aim to show that further um, when we, uh, or when I make videos, let's say, on the scripture's perfection and on the scripture's perspicuity. But hopefully this is helpful. Um, I'll put some of these quotes in the, uh, in the video description, and you can uh, think of them what you will, uh, interact with them, set them aside. Uh, and then I'll put the links to these other videos that I mentioned uh, at the very beginning. All right, thank you. God's peace.